the 10th chapter, and this is a chapter that deals with blank. Sin. The whole chapter deals with sin, or at least as I read through the chapter, that's the way uh, I have viewed this particular text, dealing with sin. And uh, he approaches it from six different standpoints. Uh, true or false, under the Old Testament, sin was removed. No, it was not removed. It remained, did it not? And uh, because it was not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Uh, As far as Jesus Christ and His coming is concerned, He removed sin. Yes, yes, through Jesus Christ our sins can be remitted. Um, Under the Old Covenant, once our sins are remitted, they are remembered... No more. Folks, that ought to just tickle you to death. You know that? It doesn't matter how bad you've been. It doesn't matter how bad the sin was. If you've been forgiven of that sin, guess what? God will never hold that sin against you ever again. It is remembered no more. <clears throat> True or false? Uh, once we've been forgiven of sin, we have responsibilities. Yes. Uh, you know, with every blessing, guys, there is responsibility, is there not? And he talked about some of those things as well. Uh, if we fail to, um, you know, truly live the Christian life, and uh, especially if we forsake the Christian life, is there going to be recompense? Yes. And uh, he ended that particular section stating that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Okay, and now he's entered into what I classify the last section of this particular chapter. And he's exhorting them to uh, not return to sin. Okay, Uh, you be steadfast, you be unmovable, uh, never, ever, ever. Go back to that sinful way of life. And uh, we've entered into a discussion of that. He begins by telling them to remember the former days. What had happened in the former days? We talked about that the last couple of weeks. What had happened in the former days? Yeah, they had been persecuted. And guess what they did? They endured, didn't they? They made it through. They didn't forsake the Christ. What's happening to them now? They're being persecuted again, aren't they? So why is remembering the former days so pertinent to their present situation? Huh? Yeah, guys, if you've overcome in the past, right, then you ought to be able to overcome and be victorious right now. Don't, don't, you know, go back, look what you did back then. You were steadfast, you made it through the trials, you didn't forsake the Christ. And guess what? If you do what you did back then, you can make it through the trials and tribulations right now. Okay? And he pointed out that not only had they suffered, but they also what? They watched others suffer. Now folks, sometimes that can be worse than suffering ourselves, right? Remember he says, you become gazing stocks, partly, right? But he also says, partly, your persecution involved the suffering of other individuals. So uh, they had watched uh, their friends, their relatives, their neighbors, uh, their brothers and sisters in Christ go through some uh, very... Uh, difficult sufferings. And that's where we ended last week. And there is one more verse in this particular part of this admonition. Remember the former days. And it's verse 35. And that's where we'll start tonight. Notice what he says. Cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. There's two parts to that statement. Number one, the action. Cast Not away your what? Your confidence. Cast not away your confidence. Look at that word, cast not away. Don't throw off, don't lose. 
Uh, when you go, there, there are several books that you can purchase and you can go back and you can do a study of these words that are used in the biblical text. And uh, this term, do not cast away, is oftentimes used in a military reference. Okay, uh, Out on the field of battle, if you ever lost your shield, guess what? That was a disgrace. Okay? You might lose your sword, you might lose your spear, you might lose a knife, but guys, don't ever lose what? Don't ever lose your shield. At least you can still defend yourself from the attack of the enemy, can't you? If you have your shield. And if a soldier ever dropped his shield, if he ever cast away his shield, it was a disgrace to the soldier. Okay, And so that concept, what's our shield? What does Paul say our shield is? A shield of faith. Now think about that. Cast not away your shield. What's our shield? A shield of faith. Okay, guys, if you and I ever throw away our faith, if you and, ever, you and I ever drop our faith, it is a disgrace to us as soldiers in the Lord's army. Okay? So don't ever throw away your faith is what he's talking about. Notice that he refers to it as our what? Cast not away your confidence. Wow, your confidence. Strong says assurance. Thayer says your free and fearless confidence. Why do you think he calls it their confidence in this text? Why does he refer to it like that? When you're confident of something, what does that, what does that mean? Sure, okay, unwavering, right? Uh, you go out and you uh, start your car and it won't start and you hear this clicking. And what do you know? It's my battery. Right? My starter's fine. It's trying to turn over, but my battery just isn't. And you're sure of that, right? In fact, you're so sure that you go down to the parts store and you say, I need a battery, don't you? And you spend $5,000 on a battery and you bring it back, take out the old battery, put it in the car, and guess what it does? Starts. You want to know why? Because you were sure, you were confident that that was the problem. Okay? Now guys, in Christianity, you and I have a confidence. You and I have a sureness. You and I have something that you and I are holding on to that is real, true, and definite. Don't we? Is there a God? Is Jesus Christ His Son? Did He die on the cross of Calvary? Did He rise the third day? Is the Bible the Word of God? Is He coming back? Is there going to be a judgment? Is there a heaven? Is there a hell? Folks, these are questions that you and I ought to answer with a screaming yes, shouldn't we? With no doubt in our mind whatsoever because they're part of our what? Part of our confidence. I know this is true as much as I know it was the battery in my car. Now guys, if you are not confident of those things that I just mentioned, you need to do some serious study. Do you know that? You need to get with somebody, you need to get you some books, you need to get in the Scripture, and you need to make dead certain that you're confident. Because if we're not confident, guess what can happen? We can shake and bend and bow and ultimately fall, can't we? Okay, so uh, he says, cast not away your what? Your confidence. Okay, and I hope all of us in this audience are confident tonight. Okay, if you weren't, you might not what? You might not be here. Okay, you just might not be here. And uh, so uh, that's one of the reasons we do what we do, isn't it? Because we're confident. And so he says, don't cast that aside. And now he gives a reason, does he not? 
for that. He says there is an account, a reason why you don't want to cast away your confidence. Because your confidence has what? Great recompense of what? Of reward. Man, guys. There's something beyond what? This life. There's a payday, that little word, recompense. Okay? God's going to pay us, isn't He? Now, we're, we, we've done nothing to deserve this pay, do we? But He's going to pay us for what we've done. There, there, there's a payday coming one way or the other, right? And you can either be paid well and right and good, or you can receive a just recompense of reward through condemnation, can you not? You see, either way, judgment is based upon our response, our reaction to who? To God Almighty. Now folks, it's all grace, isn't it? Because if God had not acted then it wouldn't have mattered what we did. It wouldn't matter how we respond. But you see, it was God who acted first on our behalf. Now He exhorts us to what? Move toward Him and operate the way He desires us to operate. And if you do, you'll get paid well. Notice how He describes it. It is a great recompense. I looked up that little word great. It means big Great, splendid, prepared on a great scale. Has anybody ever been to a great wedding? I mean, really and truly, a great wedding? Yours? I need to hear about this wedding. I, I ain't never heard that before. <laughs> what was it, sort of like uh, Queen Diana's wedding? That great? Really? Man, I need to talk to you. I've got to get to know Gil better than I know him. Okay? <clears throat> Guys, on a splendid scale, let me ask you something. When is the church going to be reunited with her bridegroom? Right now, we're espoused to Christ. Isn't that what Paul says? For I have espoused you unto one husband. We're espoused to Christ. The, the actual wedding, however, has not transpired. When's it going to happen? Yes, when He comes again. And He's going to take us to that great wedding feast in the heavens. Folks, do you think that's just going to be a little piddly wedding? No. It's going to be a splendid, great, big, unbelievable ceremony, folks. Something that you and I can't even fathom. Do you know that? You go onto YouTube and you go back and you study some of the greatest weddings that have ever been put on. And you watch the pomp and the ceremony and the splendor and, and, and think of the money that was spent on those things. Folks, they pale in comparison to our union with God in the hereafter. It will be a great recompense of reward. Notice the lessons down there. Again, we learn that reward is a what? A motivator. Cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. Isn't that something? He lets you know. Don't give up your faith. Don't depart from the faith. Be steadfast. Because there's coming a day when you're going to get what? Reward. Folks, there's nothing wrong with giving rewards. God does it, doesn't He? You see, it motivates people to do things. And God knows that. Okay? Uh, is fear a motivator? Yeah, fear's a motivator. You know? My daddy used to motivate me out of fear a little bit. You know, I remember those days. And grace is a motivator. But folks, grace is goodness, is it not? Do you do, some, do, you do things sometimes for people because of how good they've been to you? Yeah. 
You know, as we get older, that's what we do for our parents, right? Our parents have been so good to us and they've helped us and they've done all these wonderful things. Now they need us and guess what we do? Their grace motivates us to do what we need to do on their behalf. Well, God's grace is His goodness toward us, is it not? And that's a motivator. And Paul makes mention of that in 1 Corinthians 15, 10. But guys, there's nothing wrong with reward as a motivator. Number two, we must never forget that our reward is great prepared on a grand scale. Anybody ever had a big birthday celebration done for you that you weren't prepared for? I bet Eva has. I bet she's had about 20 of them in her lifetime. She just lives in a celebration. You know what? But, uh, you know, it's nice when somebody throws you a big surprise party, isn't it? You know, you're not prepared. You're not ready. And all of a sudden you walk in. Man, there's all these decorations. Five or six cakes. White cakes with icing, chocolate cakes with, I'm, I'm hitting my 60th is coming up. Okay. <laughs> ah, Kathleen threw me a pretty big one for my 50th when we were at, uh, uh, in Paris, and I had no clue. The worst thing about it, I was sick as a dog that night. Oh, I had a sinus infection that just, I mean, I went to work, you know, to Wednesday Bible class, and then I went down uh, stairs, and there's this huge party, and everybody's there, and I'm just sick. And I'm going, man, if we can just get through this hour and a half. Yeah. Oh, all these old women jumping on you, you know, and taking pictures. You go, oh, man, please, you know. But guys, all the parties and all the celebrations that you and I have ever experienced, they don't hold a candle to what God has in store for us. Okay? And I wish I could get that across to us so that we would really live in anticipation of that. You know what? It's just so hard to get that through. Um, and notice that last part. If we cast away our confidence, guess what? There is no recompense of reward. Now, who's he writing to? Nine Christians, right? Oh, he's writing to Christians. And what does he tell them? If you cast away your confidence, you can what? Lose your reward. We can fall from grace. My, my, Calvin is wrong. The ones saved, always saved folks, are wrong, aren't they? Those who teach the impossibility of apostasy are wrong. Once you're saved, you are not always saved. Folks, that is false doctrine. I have a question in your notes there. If it's not possible for a Christian to throw away his assurance, why did the inspired writer warn us against us? It's a useless warning, isn't it? If once you're saved, you're always saved, you can never cast away your confidence and lose your reward, then why did he warn us not to do that? Just ridiculous. It's so funny, guys, when you're studying texts like this and you're reading from Barnes, who was a Presbyterian, and you're reading from uh, Clark, who was a Methodist, and they're trying to explain these passages, you know. Uh, they do one of two things, okay. They, they, take, they just teach the truth and kind of forget their doctrine <laughs> that they really believe, or they try to explain away what the text is trying to say. Okay, That's the only two alternatives that you have, isn't it? And uh, what I found interesting is a lot of times both of them, especially in this particular section of the Scripture, just affirm the truth. And I was going, really? And yet they remained Presbyterians and Methodists. doesn't make sense. Okay, now we enter into another section. Renew your what? Patience. When we think of patience, usually we think of staying calm when kids are out of control. Right? You know? 
Yeah, yeah, or, yeah, there you go. There's another one. Traffic, you know. We're driving down the road. Traffic's terrible. People are weaving and bobbing in and out, uh, you know. Uh, and, and so we, be patient. Be patient, you know. We've got this little minute view of patience, okay. I find it interesting that he tells them, you need to renew your patience. Notice what he says. He assesses them. He says, for ye have need of Patience. We could probably say that to a lot of people, couldn't we? Patience. Strong says, cheerful endurance, constancy. They are steadfastness, constancy, endurance. In the New Testament, the characteristic of a man who is not swerved from his deliberate purpose and his loyalty to faith and piety, even by the greatest trials and sufferings. I love the way Barnes put it. Lie calmly in the hands of God and submit to His will day by day. Folks, that's wonderful, you know. Doesn't matter what's going on around you. Doesn't matter what's happening to you. Doesn't matter who's afflicting you. You just what? I just rest in the hand of God and just keep being what? Faithful. That's patience. Okay, that's patience. Notice this next statement. The word patience involves our remaining under trial. Man. When you experience pain, what's the first thing you want to happen? You want it to go away, right? And you'll do whatever you can do to get it to go away. Okay? You'll rub it, take medicine for it, go cut it off, whatever you got to do to get rid of the pain, right? When you and I are suffering, what do we want to do? We want to get rid of it, don't we? I'm tired of this. This is ragging on me. This is taking a toll on my faith. This hurts. This is not fun. I, I, I don't remember anybody promising me this, you know. And so what happens to a lot of individuals, the very minute that struggles and trials and difficulties come their way, they want out of it. Well, guess what's the easiest way to get out of struggling as a Christian? Mm -mm. Yeah, just quit being a Christian, right? If I quit being a Christian, then guess what? I can have my job back, Right? I'm a brick mason. I can have my job back. If I quit being a Christian, I can have my mom and daddy's $10 million inheritance that they're about to give me. If I quit being a Christian, my wife and children will come back and live in the house with me. These are the kind of things, if I quit being a Christian, they'll let me out of jail. If I quit being a Christian... I won't have to suffer in the lion's den tomorrow. If I quit being a Christian, they'll give me my child back who they're going to throw in the lion's den tomorrow. Folks, these are the kind of things they were facing. Okay, not, not some rain outside. Okay. Oh, it's raining. Just don't know if I can get down to that building. Oh boy, that's a you're being persecuted. Aren't you? I mean, you jump in your garage, car in your garage, get dropped off under the awning, right? Get picked up under the awning, drive back into your garage, never get an ounce of drop on you. Oh, I can't go, it's raining. Poor toots. You know, we need to go back and have to suffer what they suffered. When we were at the children's home, <clears throat> uh, there, there was one, uh, it's called the Farmer's Trail. It was a one-mile hike straight up a hill, okay? Uh, it, it wasn't really a path. It was where the water had washed out the trail. And you've got a 40 to 60-pound pack on. And you go about 100 yards, 200 yards, guess what you want to do? I want the pack off. You know what? You go another 100, 200 yards, guess what? I want the pack off. You're struggling. You're suffering. And guess what all the kids are doing? They want the pack off. Okay, but guess what you got to do? If you're going to make it up the hill, it's just a mile. It seems like it's 10 miles. 
If you're ever going to make it, guess what you do? One foot in front of the other. Doesn't matter how slow you're going. One foot in front of the other, and you never, watch this, get out from under your suffering. You keep the what? You keep the pack on. And eventually, guess where you make it? Make it to the top of the hill. Everything's wonderful. Okay? Guys, that's, that's being patient. That's what we have to do. Rather than cast off our responsibilities to the Christ, rather than giving up our Christianities, guess what we do? We remain under the trial, don't we? And that's the definition of patience. And I thought that was just a beautiful, uh, beautiful definition. Okay? Now, that's the assessment. Okay? You have need of what? Patience. And now he exhorts them again with the requirement. Okay? This is what, this is, what is required of us to be patient individuals. That after ye have done the will of God, ye might what? Ye might receive the promise. Wow. He talks about the reward. You might receive the promise. Folks, that promise involves what he just talked about. That better and enduring what? Substance. Where is it? In heaven, he says. That's, that's the promise. That's the reward. Heaven. But notice that he says that you have to do something, right? There's a requirement to it. After that ye have what? Done the will of God. After that ye have done the will of God. Got that? You don't get the reward before you do the will of God. You get the reward when? After you've done the will of God. And guess what the will of God is? Bear under the load. That's the will of God. Don't give up. Don't throw it off. Don't cast away your shield. And guys, it doesn't matter how long it goes on. You just keep what? You just keep being patient, don't you? Notice what Jesus says. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that endureth to the end shall be saved. Man, how long do you have to endure? To the end. Till you draw that last breath and the Spirit leaves your body, you endure. Until you open up your eyes and see the Lord Jesus returning in the clouds of glory, guess what? You endure. And you never quit. If we fail to do the will of God, guess what, folks? The promise is not ours. The promise is not ours. Now, I find it interesting that right now he puts in this little alert. Okay? He makes this little statement. It almost seems kind of out of place from, from the context of everything that he's been talking about. But listen to what he says. For yet, for yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Wow. What does that sound like? For yet a little while, he that shall come will come and will not tarry. What does that sound like? Okay, what, 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 is, what is the event that's being referenced? Sounds like the second coming, doesn't it? Okay? Sounds like he's talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now listen to what he says. For yet a what? Little while. Vincent says that that little word little while in the Greek means this. A very little while. How long has it been since these words were written? Oh, 2,000 years. Just a little while. Guys, if little while does not mean little while, then guess what? We don't have a definition of little while. If if little while means 2,000 years, then guess what? Two things. Number one, we don't have a definition of little while. And number two, these words meant nothing to the Hebrews. Isn't that true? 
Why would he tell them just a little while if he knew it's going to be 2,000 years from now before Jesus comes again? Folks, he doesn't have reference to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Do you remember we said Hebrews 10, 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. What's the day approaching? Folks, it's the fall of the city of Jerusalem. Okay? Now, who is Jerusalem important to? Christians? Yeah, Jerusalem's important to Jews. Why is Jerusalem so important to Jews? Okay, it's where the temple was. It's where God set His dwelling place, is it not? In fact, it's referred to as the city of God. It's the place where the altar was located, right? Where sacrifices could be made. What's going to happen to the city of Jerusalem? It's going to be totally destroyed. The temple is going to be torn down. Not one stone standing upon another, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 24. It's all going to be gone. Now, where were these people wanting to go back to? Where were they wanting to go back to, these Christians? Judaism! Oh, you're smart. You want to go back to a religion that's about to be totally annihilated. Does that even make sense? You see what he's really doing? He's exhorting them to remain what? Faithful and steadfast. For yet a little while, he that shall come will come, and he will not tarry. And that city of Jerusalem, and all that stuff that revolves around, Judaism, it's not even going to be here any longer. Folks, it's been 2,000 years, almost, since any Jew went to the temple to worship. It's been almost 2,000 years since any animal sacrifice was offered at the altar of God. Isn't that something? It's been almost 2,000 years since the Day of Atonement has been celebrated by the Jew the way it's supposed to be celebrated. Why? Because there is no temple no altar, there is no longer a city of God. It was destroyed by the Roman armies. And you want to go back to that? He's encouraging them. Don't cast away your confidence for yet a little while. He that shall come will come and he will not tarry. The destruction of Jerusalem is right around the corner. Did Jesus give signs to the destruction of the city of Jerusalem? Yes, guys, go back and read Matthew 24. Everybody thinks that's signs for the second coming. There are no signs for the second coming. But there were signs for His coming against the city of Jerusalem. Guess how many Christians died in the destruction of the city of Jerusalem? None. Every one of them escaped because they could see the signs, couldn't they? Thousands upon thousands of Jews lost their lives in that destruction. I wonder how many of them were unfaithful Christians. Wouldn't that be sad? They could have escaped. They, they, they were warned. And yet, they were destroyed. Man. Look down at the lesson. Folks, when suffering, we should not give up because deliverance may be just around the what? Right around the corner. Very quickly, verses 38 and 39, the resignation to be faithful. Now the just shall live by faith. Folks, that's a phrase taken out of the Old Testament and it's repeated three times in the New Testament. How do you and I live? By faith. Notice point B there. It is interesting that it follows hard upon a verse that reveals that after we have done the will of God, we receive the promise. Living by faith and doing God's will are what? Synonymous. 
After that ye have done the will of God. The just shall live by faith, folks. Living by faith is doing God's will. Got it? If you're not doing God's will, then you're not living by what? You're not living by faith. So there's the axiom. Notice the apostate. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no what? No pleasure in him. Draw back. To withhold under. To cover. To shrink. To draw back. To withdraw oneself. To shrink. To be timid. Barnes says, if such a case should occur, no matter what might have been the former condition, and no matter what love or zeal might have been e evinced, yet such an apostasy would expose the individual to the certain wrath of God. That's, Bar that's, that, that's uh, Barnes, folks. That's a Presbyterian who said that. <clears throat> Notice he says, my soul shall have no pleasure. And he used the word suke. What is God? He's spirit. Okay? My whole being, my spirit, my suke, will have no pleasure in you if you do what? If you draw back. Notice God has no pleasure at all in an individual who obeys the gospel and draws back. I ask some question. He forsakes God for what? Is the what better than God? Can the what do more for him than God? Is the what lasting and enduring? Folks, what are you forsaking God for? You're telling me it's better than what God can give you? Wow. Lastly, there's the appraisal. But we... Okay, now he talked about the apostate, right? There's some who will what? There's some that will draw back. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition. Guys, that little word perdition is a strong word right there. Loss, ruin, destroying, utter destruction, a perishing, a ruin. If you and I leave the cause of Christ, what can we expect? Destruction. Ruin. Eternal condemnation. It's pretty potent, isn't it? But he says, we are not of those people but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. I write down there, this is not salvation by faith only. See verse 36 again. This is a group that all should be part of. And lastly, it is a choice that all men have to make, isn't it? Guys, here we are. We're Christians, right? We're trying to go to heaven. We've got a choice to make. Am I going to draw back? And lose my soul? Or am, or am I going to what? Believe to the saving of my soul. You see, there's only one way to get to that glorious celebration, isn't there? And it's how the just shall live by faith. That's what he's encouraging you to do. Now, he's about to enter into chapter 11. Okay, Remember, these ver he says, we're living by what? We're, we're going to live by faith. And we're going to save our souls. Just like, guess who? Tons of people in the past. And he's going to throw up example after example after example of faithful people from the past. Why do you do that? That's right. Ex folks, remember I said that part of the a growth process as a Christian is to find you an example in what? Following, right? Well, if you want to be faithful, go back and look at the faithful of the past and do what they did. Not exactly, right? But do, be faithful the way they were faithful. So we're about to get into probably the most uh, familiar chapter to us. But uh, there's a lot of things that are said in that chapter, guys, that, we, that, that just make you, your head spin, okay?